All right. Good morning or good afternoon to you, depending on where you're located. Um, this is Una Daly from the Community College Consortium for OER, and I want to welcome you to our May webinar on OER vetting. Um, and we're looking at three aspects today, cultural relevance of your content, accessibility, and licensing. And we have three uh, wonderful presenters who are, we are going to hear from in a moment. Can everyone hear me out there? I'm going to assume you can hear me. Um, Lori, can you hear me out there? I can. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Thank you very much. Just wanted to confirm that before I uh, went along here. Um, we are using the GoToWebinar platform uh, today, as many of you know, um, and we're going to ask you, our attendees, and we're really excited to see we have over 50 attendees from around the country here, um, so we know this topic is of great interest. Um, please type your questions and comments in the uh, questions area, and um, I have Kiri Dolly and other folks helping me to copy those into the chat window this morning so that we can um, get them answered by the panelists, and you can also see those answers as they come out. Um, we will um, hold most of the uh, major questions till the end, uh, but we will try and answer in the, in the chat area as we go along. So thank you for your patience on that. Um, so uh, just quick agenda, um, we're going to have an introduction to our speakers coming up just in a moment, a uh, brief overview of CCCOER, and then we're going to get right into the topic um, here um, with um, the culturally, culturally relevant aspect of OER um, being our first topic, then accessibility in OER, and finally license review and attribution um, components. All right. First up, let's meet um, Lori Cacalozzi. She is the Dean of Humanities and Learning Communities at Bunker Hill Community College. Hello, happy to be here. Uh, Bunker Hill Community College is located in the heart of Boston's Charlestown neighborhood, and I am looking out my window right now um, at the Bunker Hill Monument. So for those of you who visited Boston, um, you may be familiar with the monument. We are the largest community college in Massachusetts, serving close to 14,000 students and um, are what I would call a profoundly diverse institution. Over 60% of our students are students of color. So cultural relevance is a topic near and dear to our hearts. Uh, wonderful. And, um, and um, we're delighted to have Lori here this morning uh, to talk about that topic. And next up is uh, Paula Mish Mishnewitz. Um, and she may need to correct me on that. She's an instructional designer at Salt Lake Community College. And we're uh, thrilled also to have Paula here to talk about um, what's happening at her college and also about the process they use for um, ensuring that OER is accessible. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm in Salt Lake City, Utah, where it's a beautiful sunny day, going to be in the 70s. So <laughs> um, I am excited to be here. Um, we're the only community college in Utah because really Utah isn't that big, but we serve um, Salt Lake City and two other counties uh, right around us. And I'll be talking more about what we do with OER later on. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much, Paula. We're really thrilled to have you as well this morning. And um, our third speaker, and also the president of the Community College Consortium for OER, Quill West, is here. She's the Open Education Project Manager at the Pierce College District in Washington. And uh, Quill, please say hello if you. Hi, everybody. It's nice to be here and be able to chat about this. Um, Una, I hate to put do this, but I lost. I don't have your slides anymore. Is your desktop not sharing anymore? Um, there it's we go. Back. Thank you. Um, somehow I, I lost my connection. So go ahead, Quill. <laughs> Would you like to introduce yourself? Um, you were. I'm the Open Education Project Manager, um, and I'm really excited to talk about this. <laughs> Great, and we're really we're really pleased to have uh, Quill with us this morning. And she's also she's a very frequent speaker um, 
so um, I think many of you know her as well. All right. Uh, briefly, I wanted to go over the Community College Consortium for OER mission. You know, we are celebrating our 10-year anniversary this summer. Uh, we were founded in Northern California, uh, but always with an eye towards the consortium. And um, so we, of course, have um, members across the country um, and many folks who participate with us. Um, most, of, most of our goals and missions remain the same. Um, it's around expanding access and awareness to high-quality open educational materials. Um, but at the heart of it is improving student success. And those things haven't changed, even though the technology's changed, and you know, even you know, the trends around OER adoption, you know, we're moving into pathways, although of course we continue to strongly support OER adoption um, in individual courses as well. But um, at the heart of it is um, helping our students to be successful in their academic careers. And um, just a picture of our members across the country, and we're uh, so excited to move that from 21 to 22 states and provinces. Uh, Mitchell College in, Northern, in North Carolina joined us, and they are the first college in North Carolina to join CCCOER, and so we are um, thrilled to have them on board. All right, uh, getting to our main topic today. Um, you know, uh, when I was planning this with our executive committee, uh, that includes uh, Lisa Young, who um, is our professional development um, VP, and um, Quill West, we, we decided we wanted to pack um, kind of all of the essential elements into uh, one webinar around how you select OER to use and, and ensure that it's appropriate. And um, so we came up with quality, accessibility, and open licensing, and that you really need to ensure that when you're selecting OER to adopt into your classroom or you're developing it yourself or adapting. And you know, as the year went on, we started to really realize that the quality issue has been worked quite a bit uh, around peer review, and those are all very essential pieces, but the cultural relevance and engagement with students was an emerging area. Um, of quality that really hasn't been explored fully. And so we were really excited to work with Bunker Hill on this um, because they have been doing some very innovative work in this area, even pre their OER uh, uh, work. Um, but they're bringing that forward with their Z degree. And then, of course, accessibility has always been near and dear to our heart at CCC OER. We know if we don't make our materials accessible to students with disabilities, we are truly not expanding access. And finally, open licensing is, is, is a challenging area sometimes, and so having a process around that to help faculty, uh, librarians, and, and staff who select materials to be able to ensure that um, they're using properly licensed materials and attributing it is another key piece of this. And so we hope you enjoy this webinar and find it informative. Um, and I want to pass this on now here to uh, Lori, Lori Tabalosi. And Lori, I'm just going to change to make you a presenter. Let me see. And there we go. Confirming, Una, that you can see uh, my screen? I can, absolutely. Wonderful. Uh, so, as I mentioned, um, we are located in Charlestown, Massachusetts. We also have a campus in Chel nearby Chelsea, Mass. Um, and we are one of the most diverse colleges in New England. Um, more than 60% students of color. This is, we can take a look at our demographics here. Two out of three of our students work, many of them full-time. Um, and two out of three also receive financial aid, um, with 57% um, receiving Pell Grants or Pell Grant eligible. In addition, we have over 1,000 international students uh, speaking 75 languages. So when I say profoundly diverse, that just gives you a sense of the flavor of the institution. Our average age is 26, and we are close to 60% female in terms of gender ratio. We embarked on the OER degree initiative a year ago when we were awarded a grant by the Dream. And this grant um, was designed to enable us to fully build an OER degree in under three years. We chose our liberal arts program of study, which is our largest program of study at the college and enrolls 4,000 students. And we chose this degree because we wanted to go broad. We wanted to be able to include 
disciplines across our general education program um, so that there would be many courses across the curriculum that would be designed as OER. Um, we had a solid partner and have a solid partner in Lumen Learning through this effort. They've been providing training as well as implementation resources um, under the grant. And over two years, what we are doing is engaging four cohorts of faculty to apply to become part of the project and to join a community of practice in that given semester along with their colleagues and to either adopt, adapt, or build OER with both internal support through our library and our online resources staff, as well as external support through Lumen. In the context of our participation in Achieving the Dream and Lumen, um, OER has a very specific definition, so I thought I would just take a step back and share that with you. Um, so when we talk about OER here at Bunker Hill, we're talking about teaching materials that are in the public domain or licensed to allow free and unfettered access to anyone and free permission to engage in retaining, reusing, revising, remixing, or redistributing materials, um, which uh, Lumen has affectionately called the five R's. Our degree initiative has several goals. The first goal is to reduce textbook costs, um, which we've already begun to see significant gains in, even in the first semester of implementation. Uh, we've also wanted to deepen our faculty's abilities to do capacity to do curricular design and also their technological skills. Uh, we intend to offer the OER pathway to at least 1,800 students a semester by the end of the grant period. And importantly, we want to scale course sections across programs of study so that we're not just impacting ultimately the liberal arts program, but multiple programs across um, our college. And finally, it's important for us, given who we are, um, that we develop OER that's aligned with our institutional mission to be culturally relevant. In terms of quality, I just want to take another step back for a moment and talk about how we ensure quality um, in our OER. First is that we have a select, selective faculty application process. So our faculty apply. Um, it is competitive. In our first round, we had close to 20, I think we had 26 applications. Um, and selected a cohort of eight faculty in that first round. And faculty participate in a community of practice where they problem solve, where they share information with one another. They engage in initial and ongoing professional development that's provided both by Lumen and by our internal resources. There's a cross-functional leadership team made up of um, administrative leadership as well as faculty leadership and staff support and resources to help move the project forward. And we are using a train-the-trainer approach so that our faculty and our internal staff are learning from Lumen so that we can, as time moves on, offer the training internally entirely. Uh, we emphasize learner-centered instruction and assessment. And then importantly, we're committed to a curriculum that um, sustains cultural wealth that is culturally inclusive and culturally relevant, which is what I want to spend some time talking about now. Our work in cultural relevance is grounded in a number of theoretical foundations. The first is Paris's cultural wealth framework, um, and you see the basic tenets of that framework um, before you. In order to begin to engage in this work, um, teachers need to understand the systemic nature of racism, the role that education plays in perpetuating racial and ethnic inequities, they need to understand the deficit lens that dominates the narrative that's used to discuss students of color and community college students in general. And they need to understand that an asset-based approach and the development of authentic human relationships is critical to the work of being culturally relevant. Another framework that's informed our work has been Yasso's cultural wealth framework. Um, and what Yasso's contributed to the conversation is a focus on the very specific assets that students bring with them to their educational enterprise. For example, students who are bilingual or trilingual are not at risk in this model, um, but rather they have an advantage. This is seen, um, and, and it is, an asset for students. Um, similarly, students who um, have family relationships that are strong and powerful, those families can be brought into the educational enterprise as opposed to seeing families as a potential risk. In terms of practices that we have enacted, we've drawn upon Ladson's billing, Ladson Billing's seminal work from 1995. Uh, she focused on three foundational elements of culturally relevant teaching. 
academic excellence, which refers to the high standards um, that culturally relevant teachers keep and demand, a level of cultural competence in terms of the faculty as well as the students in the classroom, and engagement with critical consciousness, which involves working with local communities of color in particular and sharing community resources and scholarship, and as well engaging students in, in action research and service learning projects. So the screen you see now in front of you are a number of best practices that are integrated into our classroom uh, teaching and learning process, whether we're teaching OER or a traditional classroom setting. To serve these foundational objectives, we've curated a number of resources that we've drawn upon. Um, we've curated both primary and secondary sources that represent diverse perspectives, experiences, and identities, and that echo the populations of students that we serve here. We've chosen texts that speak to our students' lived cultural experience. We've begun to integrate multimedia sources into our OER. Um, we've made an effort to put contemporary text into conversation with traditional or canonical texts. We've drawn, importantly, upon local resources and scholarship to fill in the gaps where we have not found those resources online. And we've engaged students in research themselves so that they can co-create the knowledge. One resource that's been very useful to us has been the Digital Public Library of America, or DPLA. Um, DPLA has a plethora of resources. Um, you can search their site by date, by location. You can find multimedia resources here um, that are Creative Commons licensed. And the, the depth and the range of resources here it, you know, can't be underestimated. To give you just an example of some of the primary source sets that we've made use of, um, you can search by subject area and time period, and you can sort using different modes of chronology, most recent first, for example, which is how I did this sort on um, subjects related to African Americans. And even in just this first initial search of the first three topics, you see something that's local to Boston. Um, you've got a novel and you've got um, Watson's Go to Birmingham from 1963. So, so there's a lot of rich material that's available through DPLA. Another resources that we, resource that we've drawn upon have been our community partners. And I just want to highlight three of those partnerships today. So the first is um, our oldest partnership, our partnership with the Museum of African American History. Um, and they are located in Boston, as well as the site out in Nantucket, Massachusetts. And our partnership with the museum has enabled us to integrate museum artifacts and resources related to the Black Heritage Trail into coursework. This predates our OER work, um, but we're now working with the museum to integrate those resources into our OER content. Second partnership has been with UMass Boston, which is our nearby and largest transfer school, um, UMass Boston's Asian American Studies program. We partnered with them to submit a National Endowment for the Humanities Bridging Cultures grant, and we have, are just finishing up that grant this May as our final third and final year of the grant. Through that grant, we have engaged local community-based organizations um, in working with our students. We've done asset mapping for community organizations. We've um, gone out into the field and had our community partners help us understand the community by leading us on tours and integrating the work of the classroom into the local community. So you see a few examples on the screen of some of the work um, that we've done port portrayed through pictures, but they've been a rich resource for us. And that Partnership became a template then for our Latino Student Success Initiative, which was a partnership with Chelsea School District, as well as UMass Boston's Gaston Institute. Um, and again, we're building on both baccalaureate, you know, scholarship at four-year institutions and the knowledge and expertise of local community-based organizations to knit resources um, into our curriculum. The quest for cultural relevance for us um, has led faculty to a number of realizations. Um, they have learned and are learning, still work in progress, to accumulate and synthesize curricular resources. Um, they've learned what they can eliminate and what they need to eliminate in terms of meaningless resources. Um, they're very excited about contributing to a culturally relevant curriculum and to a growing OER repository of that work because as Una mentioned, it's, a, it's an emerging field. Um, they have been sharing practices with one another and helping one another to problem solve within the context of the communities of practice that we're involved with. 
And this quest has also offered opportunities for students. They've engaged in their own independent and collaborative research processes to help locate resources where we have not been able to find them. Um, they have helped to evaluate source material. They've themselves synthesized sources as part of their research. What that's allowed our students to do is engage in active learning as opposed to passively consuming knowledge through our coursework and importantly to apply what they're learning in the classroom to the real world challenges that they're facing in their own communities and that you know we're all facing in both our local and global world. All right, thank you, Lori. Um, do we have any questions for Lori? I, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat window right now. Um, Not right now, we don't know. Okay, thanks, Carrie. All right, well, please feel free to um, type those questions in um, as, as, as we go along. And, um, I, you know, I, I, I just think that this is such an interesting area um, that Lori has spoken about um, and real a real opportunity to make OER um, richer and more valuable for our students. Um, you know, we talk about affordability and accessibility, um, but making um, the materials engaging and relevant for our students is, is such a critical piece. And um, next up, we are going to um, hear from Paula Mishtuitz from Salt Lake Community College on um, accessibility, uh, digital accessibility, um, with a particular emphasis on OER. Um, and let's see, Paula, I, um, okay, so, <laughs> I'm sorry, there is uh, Paula's picture, and um, I am now going to turn over, um, now turn over the presentation to Paula. Computer and so it looks perfect now um, okay Paula. awesome yeah thank you <laughs> okay so um, my name is Paula McNevich and I'm an instructional designer here at Salt Lake Community College in the e-learning department um, I have been here for about 12 years and uh, at Salt Lake Community College in the last three years we had a universal accessibility committee which was institution-wide so we've been really focusing on accessibility in all different facets um, there were subcommittees from that from the main committee and some of them um, formed a group that had to do with accessibility of uh, stuff for students for our learning and faculty to use and also there is a math accessibility working group that came from that so these are some things that I learned from being involved in these groups and I'm also going to share with you um, some of our thought processes that we have um, adopted here at Salt Lake Community College so we're in Salt Lake City, and that's a picture of us. Uh, that's the campus I'm on, and so we're right along the Wasatch Range. So if you ever get out here, it's a beautiful city right next to the mountains. Um, I also shared with you some uh, information from our SLCCC open website. And um, Una did share with me that um, our OER person shared that we did save $3 million this year. Just to let you know, we started 
fall 2014. So from there, then up to now, we were able to save students $3 million. We had 35,000 students be benefit from this um, open SLCC. And also I shared with you our um, OERs by subject because we did not focus on it from a program or a degree level. We focused it more on the um, classes that most students take. And so you will see that the math and the English are the ones that are have the highest enrollment. And we really focused on those classes and then you'll also see others that have joined in the history department business education biology and then a miscellaneous of others so that's kind of our background with oer uh, so the first thing i was going to talk about was the why and uh what we looked at was the university of montana um had to go to court and this was the resolution agreement and i think that this kind of sums it up in a great way that everyone should have access to information at any time and with ease of use and they were also focusing on all the e-textbooks lms multimedia classroom technology etc so that kind of started our conversation here at salt lake community college on what we can do um, to be going towards access for everybody at any time and so one of our things that we talked about was just our perspective and i think a lot of our perspective has always been the medical model which uh, disability is a negative thing or oh my gosh i have to do something for one student to accommodate etc and so what we've been trying to do is change our perspective to more of the social justice and universal design perspective. And what that is, is looking at is more as just that disability is a difference and that it shouldn't be thought of as something different. It's just a part of, of what we do. And so I think the last bullet is what I'd really like us to emphasize is environments are designed with accessibility in mind and then that means everybody could use whatever it is that we have. So I'm gonna show you an example to help you kind of switch your perspective is this is our, um, you know, curve that we all see, the accessibility curve. So this is right outside my building. And so this helps a wheelchair go from the sidewalk onto the street. But I think all of us have used this for many other reasons, such as baby strollers, bicycles, scooters, carts, luggage on rollers. So basically, if you think about universal design, when you create something for anybody, then actually many people can benefit from it. So it's like it could be used by everybody. And so um, that's kind of what I am hoping that you can get out of this is kind of start switching the thought process and that I'll give you some tips on, on what to look for and also when you're creating some OER on what to do that can then help it be accessible to everybody. And the principles of universal design, um, the one that I'm gonna talk about a little bit in a few minutes is more on the first one, which is multiple means of presentation, because again, that can help us out when we start looking at some interactive activities and maybe they may not be accessible, but I'll, sh I'll have you think about other ways to think out of the box. So now that we know like the why we should be doing this, um, I'm now gonna help you with some pointers on some things to look at when you're reviewing uh, different open educational resources. And so the first one that we all probably look at are textbooks. And there are two main things to be thinking about with a textbook. And um, it's the headings and it's the alt tags. So a heading, um, if you're in a web page, a heading has some tags, the H2 tags. If you're in a Word document and you're typing something up, you can format it with a heading two. In your LMS, in our LMS, which is Canvas, we can also, when we're making a page in there, make sure it has some headings and paragraph format, et cetera. And the reason why this is important is because for a screen reader, they can go and skim through the book by headings, and then they can find the particular area they wanna read. 
instead of going through 20 pages paragraph by paragraph and listening for finally some words that may seem familiar to them. Um, the other thing is the alt tag and alt tags describe images, but you don't usually see it. They're us it's usually in the background. So once again, in a web page, it's an alt tag in your Word document. If you have an image that a, a learner may need to know about so they can learn the topic, then you make sure you have a description in the alt tag. So once again, when a reader comes by, then it is read to the person who may not be able to see the image of what's going on. So here at Salt Lake Community College, um, the e-learning department and the department uh, of the DRC, the two of us gave trainings to show faculty and staff how to create Word documents with formatted headings and adding alt tags. And we also, in e-learning, make sure anybody that uses the LMS is familiar with that. Um, some other things to think about uh, is a lot of times we use PDFs, so make sure that sometimes people scan text, and so make sure that that PDF isn't uh, scan text because that would be hard for a reader. Um, another thing is descriptive links. So I gave an example that actually I linked that to our slcc.eu homepage, but I didn't give you the URL. So that's what they mean by a descriptive link. Um, I share here that if you have someone that can test it with a screen reader, that would be the best way to make sure that all of your documents or web pages uh, can be formatted correctly. Uh, so I would highly recommend seeing if you have an accessibility person on your campus or if your uh, DRC Disability Resource Center could help you out. Um, I found it interesting that last week on our email, we had some talk about accessibility for math books. And uh, as I shared with you early, earlier, we had a math accessibility working group, and that's our focus was we were creating some OER textbooks and how do we create it so it is accessible. And I was gonna share with you the things that we, uh, and the math department is going forward with, that anything that they, are making equations, they make sure that it's in Word and they're using math type, which is a plugin for Word. And then if that's all set like that, then they can export it out as a MathML. And then that's in an HTML format that a screen reader can read. Um, just to let you know, in Word, when you do use the Word uh, program, it does the LaTeX, which isn't something that could be used for a screen reader. Um, and the last thing is then if you're creating your own textbook, you should, everything I just said above are things that you should be thinking about when you are creating it. And as I said, for us at Salt Lake Community College, we've decided to use Word. And then, um, and then usually what happens is you can then export it out in different ways. It could be changed into a web page, it could be changed into a PDF. Um, for our math, uh, another thing I forgot to mention was we were using SVG images because then if someone needs to enlarge it, it enlarges without pixelation. And also we've been playing around with SVGs and embossing printers so that then people can um, feel the graphs. So um, the, the last thing that we at SLCC are still working on is then where do you store all of this and how do you share all of this? Um, so it's just something to be thinking about when you are creating your own uh, textbook or uh, OER with uh, Word is where where is this all going to be shared and where is it going to all be stored? So these are just things to be looking at for accessibility for a textbook. Um, the next thing I was going to share is video, which a lot of us like to use. And so we always try to find videos that are already captioned. Um, and there's an example of closed captioning. So that means there's words on the screen while you're watching the video. Um, just to let you know, there is another uh, captioning. It's called audio description, which is actually more uh, people speaking, talking about what's on the screen. Um, I, our group hasn't started that, but I just wanted to let you be aware of that, that that's another layer of um, 
captioning that helps uh, the blind people to know what's going on on the screen because they can hear but they don't know what's going on. So if you uh, have a video that doesn't have closed captioning, there is amara.org, which is a crowdsourced tool that you can go and uh, create some captioning. If you own it and have a YouTube channel, you can edit the auto caption. So it can auto caption for you and then edit it. And also there's outsourcing. So we at Salt Lake Community College have decided for anything that's created with our e-learning department that we have monies to go and outsource it and make sure that it's closed caption. So this is where I was starting to talk about the universal design for learning um, in the multiple modes of presentation. Um, sometimes you may find some interactive activities that may not be accessible. So the example I have on the screen is actually a timeline. Uh, and what I did was I created a table with the dates and events right there so that if someone wasn't able to interact with it, they still are able to learn the content on there because they were able to uh, get it through the table. So what we try to do here at Salt Lake Community College and especially in when we're designing with faculty the online classes, we're always trying to think of alternative ways so that depending upon the student, maybe they like to read better, maybe this is better with a screen reader, um, maybe the closed captioning is better for uh, English as a second language student. Um, so we're always trying to think of the multiple ways to show something or interactivities, are there multiple ways to have it so that anybody could use the activity and learn. So the last thing is, I've just shared with you lots of things, and some of you may be overwhelmed. <laughs> so what I was going to share with you is to collaborate. So um, other institutions have great resources. Um, the next page is going to be some links. So BC Open Textbook Accessibility Resource is a great thing to talk about it from a textbook perspective. Um, Portland Community College also is great for the math accessibility. They've done a lot of research on that. So that's a great starting point. I'd also recommend that you uh, collaborate with other people on campus. If you're a faculty here, are there is somebody in the Disability Resource Center can help out with this? Um, do you have e-learning group with instructional designers and instructional technologists that can possibly help you learn this or help you uh, uh, do, do anything with uh, any of your learning objects or textbooks to help make it open? Um, do you have an accessibility specialist or do you have other faculty that are on your campus? So the last thing I was going to share with you is just start small. What we do here is we encourage faculty to look at their class, maybe change all their Word documents to have them accessible one semester, the next semester, make sure everything has an alt tag on it, maybe the next semester, um, make sure all your videos are closed captioned. So as long as you're moving forward and anything that you create is accessible, then it's going to be a beautiful thing later on. So the last slide is just sharing with you uh, resources that I talked about. So there are links right out to them. And it also includes our SLCC accessibility website with creating accessible documents that we have that information. So thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you, Paula. And if you could switch just to the next um, slide for me, Paula, that would be great before I um, I want to thank Paula for that uh, presentation, and she did have a really wide area to cover, and I think she really hit the high points there on accessibility. Um, we had a, we've had a couple of questions. Uh, one, um, and they're somewhat specific, um, but one thing I did want to say, is what I really just wanted to reemphasize what Paula said, is that this is um, this really has to be an all-campus effort, and so working with your DSPS or your Disability Resource Center, or whatever your college calls it, um, on campus is really critical. And you may be, uh, you know, if digital textbooks have not become a big part of your campus, you may be educating um, some of the folks in your DSPS office as well. So it might be a mutual education as you go along. Um, and hopefully your instructional design staff, you have very competent instructional design staff, such as Paula, who can, um, who can really help with that. Um, to the question, um, Paula, um, Judith was asking, what is LaTeX? Would you like to briefly uh, explain that to her? 
Sure. Um, LaTeX is a kind of is a language, a behind the scenes language that in any of the Word documents that were printed, it was a language created so that you can visually see um, a math equation. And what happens is, is that it was created for print, but now that we have the web, <laughs> um, what happened is then it. Um, readers couldn't read it, it would read it in LaTeX, which is a really bizarre language if you ever look at it. And so what happens is we've been creating uh, MathMLs and actually a combination of XHTML. And another thing, and what happens is when it gets to the equation, it reads it as, you know, a squared plus 3x equals 5, as opposed to a, a language that is really bizarre looking and sounds really bizarre. So that's the quick, what is LaTeX? <laughs> yeah, Th thank you, Paula. It, so it is sort of a legacy um, app. Um, and um, so uh, we had a couple of other requests here. One is, of course, uh, can we have copies of the slides? And yes, we post all of these slides and of course it's recording, uh, usually within 48 hours of the webinar. Uh, one thing we have to do is we have to have the webinar captioned. And so that um, that adds a little bit of a delay before we can post the recording. Um, and Paula, actually, they have asked for the links. Um, I don't know if that's something you can put in the chat window. Uh, if you could put those links also in the chat window, Paula, that would be really great. Um, oh, okay. Because um, folks would like to have those. Um, and let's see. And, and I could just do that right. All right. I have access we'll to that. that. Yeah, that's great. You okay. can just put it directly in the chat window, Paula. Yeah, okay. and uh, Laura, we also published something. Um, she um, did a definition, and we'll put that in the chat window, too, of what LaTeX is from Wikibooks. So thank you, Lori. Um, all right. Um, yeah, I apologize for the fact that we've had the preview on, on, on this last session. Um, as Paula mentioned, she has a new laptop, and um, when we rehearsed this on Monday, we were unable to get it to um, to go into regular uh, slide mode. So thank you for your patience with that. And now, uh, without further ado, we're gonna switch to uh, Quill West, who is gonna talk about license review and vetting and how she does that um, at her college and also with her, um, with her librarian. So a very interesting um, approach to developing a system around this. All right, Quill, I'm giving you um, presenter privileges now. All right, we can see we can see your desktop now. Quill, are you are you on mute? We are I hearing just you. unmuted myself. Just did it. Perfect. <laughs> okay, so you should be looking at my desktop right now, but in just one second, I will make this show. Okay, <laughs> so um, I am going to talk about the ethical use of educational materials and how we review for that, which is probably not the most thrilling thing in the whole wide world, but it is really necessary. Um, I actually, instead of those high terms, I actually think of this presentation as how we really do the final preparation for open courses so that we can distribute them. Um, it, this is a really important step for us in bringing open courses to scale because um, we might not do as full a review for an instructor who's teaching one course um, and will only ever teach that course and is not interested in other people adopting it because they're protected much more by fair use. But um, we will do a full and extensive review of courses that we know need to be shared with other instructors. Um, it is part of a lot of grants that you openly license work, including the Achieving the Dream grant. Um, but more importantly to me is that I want to be able to take a course that we have paid for as Pierce College the development on and pass it to other institutions or to other teachers at my institution. Um, so <laughs> I, I really like to think about this as a ball of yarn, except for I think balls of yarn, I'm not. 
I used to be a knitter and I'm not as much anymore, but I used to think in terms of a ball of yarn after I've managed it, it comes in the skein and you start to make the ball, you know that it's not going to get knotted up because you touched it and dealt with it. Um, and, and it doesn't knot as easily as for people who are not good at, like me, I would always try to pull the yarn out of the middle of the skein and I would end up with a big knot somewhere in the middle. Um, so part of the reason why we do this review up front is so that we don't end up with knots in the middle of our teaching of a course because material is used unethically or links to material are given that then the material shifts because it wasn't really openly licensed. Um, so that's why we do this review to avoid messes in the middle of a project because there's nothing worse than being in the middle of a knitting project in the middle of a pattern and have a big giant knot in the middle of your yarn and have to stop and clean up the knot before you can finish your pattern. So um, <laughs> rather than get into the like, really, really into the weeds about how this works at our institution, I think it's more helpful to talk about um, the development, how this process developed at our institution, what we do, um, and then how we finalize courses. So. Um, when we talk about ethics, I just want to make it really clear because we have an ethics review on all of our open courses and we talk more about license, we tech, it's more than just licensing and attribution there. We're talking about um, a bigger process um, that includes things like cultural relevance um, and uh, students' access to materials. So it, the the licensing and attribution review is a really important part of this, but it's not everything we're looking for in our open courses. Um, so when I talk to our librarians about this, I call it our, our umbrella because we're in the Pacific Northwest and it rains a lot here. Um, <laughs> um, really, the licensing and attribution review is not meant to be a big giant shield against all copyright complaints and, and issues. It's meant to be a light, protection. So um, our part-time librarians do some of this review work for us, and I am not expecting them to act like copyright lawyers. Um, I'm not a copyright lawyer and neither are they. Um, what I'm asking them to do is the first check, the first kind of assessment um, to make sure things are uh, clean enough that we know we're protected if we try to share it. Um, so we, we check for four things. Um, to get that thumbs up on your course. And you have to meet all, all of our courses have to meet all four of these criteria for us to agree to share them. So the first thing is that all intellectual property in the course is um, appropriate and the app, app, that licenses are applied appropriately. Um, so we don't have any blatant copyright violations is what we're really looking for. Um, but that we're also using the open licenses appropriately because not all open licenses are the same as we all know. Um, underpinning that is to make sure that attributions are meet a standard. Um, and we use the Open Washington standard so because of the attribution builder as our building for, for attributions. So basically what we're looking for is that there's an attribution on every piece of material that is openly licensed and that that um, attribution is clear to people who want to read it. Um, the next thing is to make sure that the teacher has some kind of explanation about the important points of this class, the high points of the class, how they teach it, um, it included in with the material. It's not necessarily about application, about the licensing, but it's really helpful for future adopters to see what was on somebody's mind when they designed the course. So it's kind of the forward, it's the teacher's forward before they start teaching, if you were to think about it in terms of packaging a book. Um, and then we always look for a course map or a content catalog. I call it a content catalog when I train about it, um, which is a collection. Uh, it shows all of the resources that are used in the course in, the, in a big spreadsheet. And that's so that it's easy for us to see, first of all, everything that's in the course. It's also um, really, really helpful in terms of making sure that we're at, um, aligning our outcomes to the materials that are being, being used. Um, so every one of our open courses has to have these things to pass and be considered an open course at Pierce College. Um, 
So as I said, our, we're right now training part-time librarians to do this review work for us because um, initially there was one person at my institution doing this work and her name was Quill West and she got too busy to keep doing it all by herself. Um, <laughs> Um, so instead, we tried to put together, we're right now building a training, and I will admit that it's not quite perfect yet, but um, training needs to be self-paced and on, on their own because um, part-time librarians are very, very busy people who have multiple jobs in many cases or who are only on our campus for short periods of time. So we want them to be able to work through a training on their own. So we've set up a set of readings that are in process that are kind of here's how to do this and then um i broke i took an open course that had past review and broke it in many many places and then the librarians actually go through that practice course and find the broken pieces and report them so they prepare a report that says here's what i'm seeing here's what could be fixed and then they send that to me um, and that will be the process actually that they'll start, that they'll use going forward with all open courses that they're reviewing so when the part-time librarian reviews an open course they'll be looking for things that are broken and then they will send that report to me and then i'll take it from there so we'll never make it um, because of the nature of part-time work and because of the nature of the relationships with diverse faculty um, it will never be the reviewer's responsibility to contact the instructor to work out issues in the course it will be the open education leads responsibility to do that until we find a better system so what we're really trying to do is build a system for these reviews because um, folks who recognize the OER Achieving the Dream grant um, know that Lumen Learning right now is doing this process for us, um, but they're not going to be there forever. Um, so we really want to have a process in place that will pick this up as we continue to expand our OER offerings. Um, so that's actually our entire process i'm not going to spend too much time talking about it but i do want to just take one second and talk about what our training looks like um, so this is a page from we all of our readings are in candela um, because it's easier for me to share candela with 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 people rather than enrolling them in like a canvas course um, so this may look familiar to some people. It's actually it's from Open Washington. Um, some of this page is from Open Washington, and some of it is my own work. Um, but as you're seeing, um, it's it's a page to help people learn about open licenses and how it applies. So the big thing here is not to focus on how to openly license your own work, but how to assess other people's work to see if their license, their application of the licenses is correct. So it's a different um, interpretation of licensing. But the idea here is to empower our own review process so that um, there's less ambiguity involved in it. Um, so rather than kind of keeping talking about this, I think I want to see if folks have questions. And I know the first question is going to be, will you share your resources? Yes, I will, just as soon as I format them so that they're usable by other people. I will share everything I can. I can't share our broken course because um, it intentionally has copyrighted material in it. <laughs> um, so I can't share the broken course, but I can tell you how I broke it so that you could break your own courses so that your faculty can practice on courses of your very own. Um, so I would be really, really happy to take questions now. All right, uh, thanks Quill. That was a great overview and, and we did get uh, several requests and I, I recognize that they are librarians and they, they would love to get your training materials when you're ready to release those. So thank you very much. Um, and we're waiting on questions there. Uh, while we're waiting, um, while we're waiting, mm -hmm. I want to spend. Oh, go ahead. So oh, I was just resharing my screen, giving you back control. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah. And I have switched out. Um, I also posted something in the um, 
in the um, chat window there about where to find the slides and um, and the recording um, on our website. And if you want to be notified of upcoming events um, or when we post uh, the recordings, we we generally send out a message as well uh, so that people can pick that up in case they want to review it or perhaps they weren't able to attend. On uh, June 14th, uh, which is in about a month, we will have um, our final webinar of the spring season, and it will be on building OER sustainability on campus. And we have two longtime leaders of OER, uh, James Clapper Grosclag from College of the Canyons, um, who has been involved with CCC OER uh, for 10 years and was our past president for four years. Um, we'll be talking about his work uh, both um, at the college and in California, and we will be also having uh, Dr. Lisa Young, who um, uh, who is the faculty uh, director at uh, the Teaching and Learning Center at Scottsdale Community College. She's also the co-chair of the Maricopa Millions uh, Project um, and on our executive board and uh, just a longtime OER leader sharing uh, the work they're doing uh, there within their system. So hope to see you on that one. And we're still waiting here for questions. I think we have about five more minutes. Um, we know that um, the GoToWebinar system is a little uh, weak in terms of um, interactivity. Um, so we also do have um, emails here of our presenters, or you can always email me if you have some follow-up questions that um, you weren't able to share or get answered at this webinar, we'd be happy to um, take those offline. Okay, we have questions from Sarah Sweeney, and this is for Lori Catalozzi. It, the question is, was it easy for faculty work to work in a community of practice with faculty from other disciplines? I am curious about how that worked. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Sorry. Okay, I was on mute for a moment, but um, was it easy? Uh, I would say that it was energizing for faculty. Um, I won't say it was always easy because faculty needed to learn a bit about other folks' disciplines in order to help them. Um, but it was engaging and energizing because faculty so seldom have that opportunity. Um, and so in our first cohort, for example, we had uh, a faculty who was designing an American literature class, OER, and was having some real struggles in terms of cultural relevance. And you know, initially she went back to her English faculty who were not designing OER to get their input and that didn't help her much. And ultimately, you know, once she connected with the folks who were designing math courses and who were designing um, an oral communications rhetoric course, you know, it, it helped her uh, to dive into some resources that she didn't know existed. And so that cross-disciplinary function of a community of practice was, um, was incredibly helpful. I won't say it was always easy, but it was well worth it. Wonderful. Thank you, Lori and, and Sarah for the question. Um, do we have other questions? We still have we still have several more minutes and would love to answer um, additional questions. Um, while we're waiting for uh, questions to come in, um, we um, I wanted to give Paula or Quill um, any any a chance for any last comments on um, on their presentations or um, I'll, this is Paula and I would just say that uh, just be patient and there's a lot to learn and uh, like I said if you start small and just work on one part then then it'll become easier and easier. So I did, I gave a lot of information and I don't want them overwhelmed. <laughs> Thanks, Paula. And you know, I think, you know, for those of us as educators, seeing the students that we're serving, um, you know, going to the DSPS office or the Disability Resource Center as, as it may be called, and seeing those students who need access and knowing that you're helping to make that happen can make a huge difference in terms of kind of lightening the load because um, you know you, you now see who is the recipient of those um, efforts. I would just add too in terms of the relationship between Paula's content and mine, this is Lori, um, the idea of flipping that deficit lens on its head 
um, in, in all the ways that it, that it gets applied to our students, I, I, I think is, um, is something that we share in common. And, and the concept of universal design, it does just that. Um, so I think that, that that thread of using an asset-based approach to curricular design, whether it's OER or not, um, I think is vital to our work. Yeah, thank you for that, Laurie. I completely agree. Um, Quill, that we had a couple questions for you. Uh, one was, how similar is the OER review process to the QM process? And finally, how many OER courses um, have you reviewed? <laughs> um, so, uh, how similar is the review process to the QM review? Um, we have a, a full course kind of that looks at things like um, scope and depth of coverage and those kinds of things and that's very similar to QM. We designed it specifically to match the QM process um, and I can share that so I will post that um, on well I'll try to get there but while I'm talking but that might be hard. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, how many courses have I personally reviewed? Uh, I am a afraid to count. Um, <laughs> I have been doing this, this kind of review work. It's actually how I started in open education. So um, I, 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 several. Um, as our institution, we've done 25 that are like, okay, we have really good reviews on these. Some of them didn't pass review because the um, so the open licensing review is kind of an all or nothing. Um, it either fits everything's good or there's something wrong with it and I can't share it outside of my institution because of that. So um, that one is a little bit different. It's kind of like those standards in QM where 80% isn't enough. <laughs> you have to have 100%. Um, but we will often say this won't work for anything except for in your own class um, and that's fine for right now but you're going to have to make changes to get it to match what else we want so one of our requirements at Pierce College is that everybody matches that is that I it's in order to get paid for development of your course the IP review has to be go through um, and that's to protect us but it's also for scalability I um, when we're paying to develop a course we want it to be a course that other faculty members can adopt. So, um, you know, my goal is to make it so that we have a set of courses that we can hand to adjunct faculty members who are hired at the last minute so that they have something to teach with. Um, because I'd rather our default be open rather than textbooks. All right, Th thank you, Quill, for, for that answer. And um, you know, before we sign 